Room and meal, please, the girl stated, her speech heavily accented. The tavern keeper, a rough and wrinkled old man, sneered at her. I haven't heard an accent like that in quite a while, girl. Do your parents know you are so far from home? he asked with a condescending grin. The girl leaned across the bar, drawing her face closer to the barkeep. Her eyes narrowed and her face emotionless. Ilya is fine on her own. Room and meal, please, she said, drawing a coin purse from beneath her heavy clothing and leaving a few soles down on the counter. Isaac grinned as he looked away from his father and towards the newcomer. That girl isn't from around here, he said. She must have come here from the other side of the Empire, and judging by her accent, she was lucky to survive the trip as she traveled alone. Luck had nothing to do with it, his father said, his voice suddenly serious, his eyes never moving from the girl. What do you mean? She's just a girl too far from home. Are you blind, boy? Do you even see them? The girl turned back from the tavern keeper, carrying a bowl in both hands while she walked towards an empty table. His father leaned his head at her, shifting his eyes toward her neck. Isaac saw them this time. Dangling from a metal chain around her neck were three long crystals, each engraved with odd markings on their facets. Drajules, Isaac said. She's wearing them like jewelry. Perhaps her father is a treasure hunter as well, or else she's just an idiot girl who doesn't know the value of her pretty necklace. You think her a fool? His father shook his head. No, I think not. I've traded red jewels with others before, and they've always treated them the same way, like they were a poison. Terrified, a monster may jump out and tear them to bits the moment they let their guard down. I've only seen a few folk in my life carry red jewels like that. His father turned back to Isaac, leaning over the table and motioning his son to do the same. As his son came closer, he whispered, The kind of folk who wear red jewels like that are the kind of folk who can use them. Isaac's jaw dropped as he grasped what his father was suggesting. The girl was so young he hadn't considered it a possibility. Father, are you actually suggesting? Gerald nodded. Yes, son. That girl is a binder. Hello there, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Mildra, and I'll be your Gaming Monk for the evening. Some of you may recall the Pokemon Tabletop United RPG that I covered, an adaptation of the popular franchise of the same name. In a couple of that game's expansions, it talked about converting the source material into other genres of storytelling. While a novel idea, it's ultimately one that has a soft cap on it. Much like trying to adapt D&D into wholly different genres eventually runs into a wall, the DNA of the source material will always carry some assumptions. However, given other monster management games like Jade Cocoon, Monster Rancher, and the Shin Megami Tensei series, Persona notwithstanding, I think there's room to explore this approach without necessarily having all of the DNA of the most popular entry. Today, we'll be looking at one such attempt in Magi Monsters, a high fantasy take on the concept that is attempting to channel the spirit of these games, but not necessarily the name. How does it hold up? Well, let's find out. At 316 pages, Magic Monsters is a fairly straightforward read, if a bit dense. The designers carry a small bit of DNA from games like Shadowrun in that each of the book's four parts is separated by a short story. Given that the majority of the visuals consist of character art showing the various monsters and their binders, these stories are the primary way the game's setting presents itself. It's clear that the game places greater emphasis on the mechanical aspect than the setting, though. Thankfully, the game has a glossary and an index. Now much like PTU, the character sheet is going to be somewhat split between the character itself, known as a binder, and the bound monsters. We'll be exploring this with a soldier-turned-binder named Mars and his Ballistic. The first step is choosing a class and a background. The former is more of a pool of potential abilities and monster development, while the latter is a package of skills and equipment. We'll be going with the Knight and Champion archetype. Further building on that theme, we'll go with the Soldier background. Step 2 concerns your attributes and skills. We have 9 points to spend between the 3 attributes. Mars in this case has Interaction 2, Knowledge 3, and Vigor 4. 
This determines the amount of pips filled in their appropriate skills, and thus the dice rolled on that skill check. The exception to this is Athletics, Fortitude, and Strength, which grant a plus one bonus from background. In addition, we gain the Knight's features and we choose one Merit, this game's equivalent to Feats, which will slot in Charge. We also gain two Bond abilities that can be used with Bonded Magia Monsters, in our case Battle Bond and Deadly Bond. Lastly, we gain an Authority Rating of 5. Step 3 concerns the starting Magia Monster, the first creature we have bonded with. Of the starting list, we'll go with the Ballistic. Finally, Equipment. Now all characters start out with 100 souls, and we gain additional 25 souls from our background, as well as a weapon and armor. Beyond that, we'll grab a Drajul and 5 days of rations, leaving us with 10 souls. Character creation is pretty simple, and in fact I have no issue with the process itself. What I do have a problem with, however, is how it's presented. I didn't cover this in layout because I felt it was more important here, but each step does not separate its description from the actual crunch. It's one of those cases where the steps feel as if they're a bit padded. Moreover, it did annoy me a little that Binder Health isn't listed in this section, but rather later on in the book. That said, I do appreciate the development of monsters is not set in stone, and it has a good amount of wiggle room so that no two monsters will be the same after a few levels. As the saying goes, the devil is in the details. Magic Monsters uses what I call a 2DX system, in that you're always rolling a pair of dice, but the die size may change. This is compared to a target number in order to succeed at a check. For Binder's skill checks, the die size may range from D4 to D6. In combat, however, the die is always D6 by default. Furthermore, combat is the only instance where criticals are a factor, as rolling 11 or higher is considered a critical success, and rolling snake eyes is a botch. Combat is also the only time where grit, the game's extra effort mechanic, comes into play. This may be used to raise the die rolled to D8s, reduce damage, or recover health. As one might expect, there's an inbuilt assumption that the magic monsters in question will handle the bulk of combat, with their binders providing support abilities. This is all the more apparent due to a Fog of War-like rule that minimizes outside damage. Combat itself leans a bit towards the grid-based approach in one form or another, even goes so far as channeling D&D's control zones. Beyond that, every participant has a combat and utility action, with attacks and defense being rooted in physical or magical. Magic Monster's core mechanics are a bit segmented, but not exactly to the same degree as Pokemon Tabletop United was. Now one point of contention I could easily see, however, is the soft barrier between Magic Monsters and Binders. I understand why, but it's something that has a soft ceiling as things develop. It's difficult to look at this game in a vacuum, as anyone wishing to try this out has inevitably looked into other games emulating Pokemon or similar games. This is why I've compared it to Tabletop United a few times in this review. Now is it as good as that one? That's a bit of a toss-up. The monsters in this case certainly have a bit more potential in build than Tabletop United has, but this is at a cost in variety for the trainers slash binders respective builds. In both cases, there's a soft wall between combat and non-combat mechanics. However, being a new setting with new rules, I feel Magia Monsters need a stronger sense of lore within the book. While there's hints in the descriptions of classes, monsters, and the short stories, a lot more was needed in my opinion. It needs a map, or a setting chapter, lest it be seen just as fantasy Pokemon. Magia Monsters ultimately is a solid game, and it gets a stamp of playable. I do think there's a bit of wiggle room in this game to adapt into other styles, but it's one that's not quite as established in its individual identity, at least not at the time of this recording. And I don't want it to be just fantasy Pokemon. I want it to establish what is Magia Monsters. <laughs>